Hey, what's up guys, this is Matt with The Movement System. In this video, we're gonna cover four principles of biomechanics that every coach should know. Whether you're working with pro athletes or general population clients, biomechanics is one of the most valuable lenses to understand and improve movement. But honestly, most coaches don't understand the most important biomechanics concepts very well. Well, today we're gonna change that. Here's what we're gonna cover. First, we're gonna cover length tension relationship. Second, we're gonna cover eccentric versus concentric orientation. Third, we'll cover osteokinematics versus arthrokinematics. And then fourth, we're gonna cover the real role of the rotator cuff. So if you've ever found yourself wondering why a client moves the way they do or how to actually fix it, stick around because these concepts will change the way that you see and coach movement. Let's go ahead and get into it. Okay, let's start with principle number one, length tension relationship. The first thing to know about length tension relationship is that muscles have an optimal length where they produce the most force. That's because of how actin and myosin overlap at the sarcomere level. With too much overlap or not enough overlap, the cross bridge formation is reduced and the muscle can't produce as much force. This is actually one way to distinguish between a well-built machine in the gym and a poorly built one. For example, this machine does a poor job of optimizing the length tension relationship of the hamstring to maximize muscle hypertrophy. That's because the hip is fully extended, making the hamstring muscle really short throughout the range of motion. This leads to less actin myosin overlap, no passive tension, and therefore low force production. By contrast, now look at this machine. Here, the hip is flexed to about 90 degrees or more. This bias is loading toward the middle and the lengthened portion of the graph that we showed earlier. And this is a good time to mention that that graph really just shows active muscle contraction strength. This graph adds another component to that, which is passive tension. And this is important because there's emerging evidence like this that the component of passive tension strongly contributes to overall mechanical tension and muscle hypertrophy. So loading the hamstring through the mid-range and the lengthened portion optimizes muscle hypertrophy. And honestly, optimizing muscle length on different machines is just one way that understanding length tension relationships can help you as a coach. I also use this knowledge, for example, when coaching athletes acceleration. Coaching a forward torso angle during acceleration puts the posterior chain, especially the hamstrings and the glutes, at an ideal length for force production. It can take months to build five or 10% more strength in the posterior chain, but you can instantly make an athlete faster or stronger by putting their body in better positions biomechanically. As a specific example, I often coach athletes to a more horizontal shin angle in their three-point stance, allowing for better force production and force transfer into the ground. Adjusting an athlete's sprint start so that the kneecap of the back leg drops around the middle of the front foot is a pretty good target for this. I've done this and taken a tenth of a second off of an athlete's 40 time immediately. So whether you're improving muscle hypertrophy or athletic performance, understanding length tension relationship can improve your coaching. Okay, now let's move on to a big one, biomechanics principle number two, muscle orientation. When a muscle lengthens under load, it's undergoing an eccentric muscle contraction. Think about, for example, the lowering phase of an RDL. Whenever it shortens to produce force, like lifting back up, that's concentric. Now these are dynamic contractions that we're probably all somewhat familiar with, but here's where it gets more nuanced and useful. What happens whenever you're not moving? Even in static postures like standing, muscles don't really turn off, they maintain a tonic level of contraction to stabilize joints and support our body's position in space. But not all of these contractions are the same. We can consider the orientation or the nature of our static muscle contractions. Take the hamstrings, for example. According to this study, for every five degrees of anterior pelvic tilt, the hamstring has been shown to increase in length by roughly one centimeter. That's enough to create passive tension in the muscle. This passive tension or elongation puts the muscle into what we can describe as an eccentric orientation. It's not actively lengthening, but it's under tension due to the joint position and the structural demands of the posture. An athlete with a tendency toward more anterior pelvic tilt may experience chronically tight hamstrings. That said though, they might not need more stretching because it's not like the hamstring is tight and short, rather it's actually tight and long. 
because like we said, they may be eccentrically biased or that hamstring may tend toward an eccentric orientation. So instead of stretching the hamstrings, it can be more effective to reposition the pelvis through stacking strategies, rib cage alignment, and improving abdominal control. This reduces that passive strain and normalizes that hamstring's orientation. Some of my go-to exercises for athletes like this include step-ups, goblet squats on wedges, or split squats, making sure you're moving up and down like an elevator. These all help develop posterior pelvic tilt and can be cued with anterior core recruitment to help restabilize that relationship. So to summarize, you may have a client come in saying their hamstrings feel tight, but look for signs that they aren't tight and short, but rather tense and long. Signs like standing with a lot of anterior pelvic tilt, extending the spine during squats, or struggling to brace the anterior core with different movements. These are all indicating a potential eccentric orientation to the hamstrings, and then rather than continuing to stretch the hamstrings, using those stacking strategies and training the posterior chain can help instead. Now, with the same line of thinking, we can actually look at another common case. Some individuals present the opposite way with more of a sway back posture. These individuals have their hips pushed forward in front of their center of mass, and their hips tend to be more tilted back. Often it looks like they have a really flat butt. Now if you wanted to get into this posture, what would you do? Well, you'd squeeze your glutes and push your hips forward. Basically, that's their resting state. The glute max is in a shortened position, or what you can consider a concentric orientation. Now, ironically, a lot of these clients notice that they have a flat butt, and what do they try to do to fix it? They do glute bridges, hip thrusts, and cable pull-throughs. The problem is though, that their glutes are already shortened and they're just driving more shortened positions because that's what's comfortable and feels natural to them. But to improve their movement patterns and their muscular development, we need to address their length tension relationship. They actually need to learn to lengthen the glutes. The best way that I've found to do this is with a kickstand RDL reaching across the body. To do this, you wanna stand with 80 to 90% of your weight on your front foot. I like setting the opposite foot back in a kickstand position or even pushing back into a wall. Then you're gonna slowly hinge your hips and make sure that your hips are translating back without your kneecap moving back. So basically you want your kneecap to stay over your shoelaces as your hip pushes back. If you're doing this correctly and tracing your fingertips down your shin and reaching across the body, you should feel a really deep stretch in the back of the stance leg hip. I can usually get the clients that I coach to feel that in one specific spot that they can put two fingers on, and that's a really good indication that you're actually getting length through that posterior hip capsule. So as you can see, considering the orientation of the muscle can make a huge difference in how you train. Clients tend to choose movements that feel good and are easy for them, but if you can step in and evaluate with a biomechanical lens, then you can introduce training that truly makes a difference and changes how they move and feel. If you're learning something and appreciate how much work goes into these videos, make sure you hit that like button as it really helps out our channel. Also subscribe so you don't miss any future videos. This is also a great time to mention that if you wanna learn these concepts fully in depth with 3D visuals, we just released a brand new course for trainers and coaches. We built the anatomy and biomechanics of movement in collaboration with Muscle in Motion to teach you the most important aspects of muscular anatomy, biomechanics, and more. I'm a really visual learner and I wished that something like this existed when I was trying to learn these complex biomechanical topics. It didn't exist, so we built it. I really think that this is one of the best continuing education courses for trainers and coaches. You can never know too much anatomy. We got it approved for CEUs from seven different organizations, including the NSCA, NASM, and ACE. So if you're looking for CEUs and to level up your knowledge of anatomy and biomechanics, click the link in the description below or head to themovementsystem.com to check it out. Okay, now for principle number three, osteokinematics versus arthrokinematics. We're going deep in this video. Here's a quick breakdown. Osteokinematics are big joint movements like flexion and extension and rotation. Arthrokinematics are subtle joint surface movements like roll and slide and glide and arthrokinematics is everything when it comes to joint health and performance. Let's take shoulder flexion, for example. If someone can't get their arm overhead, most coaches blame tight lats, but in many cases, it might not be a tissue issue. Specifically, if there's pain in and around the shoulder joint, rather than tightness in the lat muscle belly, we need to go deeper and think about arthrokinematics. So here's the important principle. And my mind was blown the first time that I learned this. The shoulder doesn't just roll in the socket like this. Instead, 
it rolls up and glides down, rolls up and glides down. At least that's how it should function. Studies like this show us that rotator cuff fatigue can reduce inferior glide of the humeral head in the glenoid. When the rotator cuff is fatigued, instead of the humeral head staying centered, it moves upward and forward. And this can compress sensitive structures. This can result in subacromial impingement, bursitis, stress on the labrum, or long-term wear on the supraspinatus tendon. And once we understand the arthrokinematics of what's going on at the shoulder, we can build function from there. So really understanding this arthrokinematic relationship highlights the importance of foremost properly training the rotator cuff, which we're going to address in principle number four. It also highlights the importance of understanding proper scapular positioning and cueing and posture when we're training to ensure that we're training the right positions and structures and not further irritating certain anatomical structure. So let's dive into principle number four, the real role of the rotator cuff. To start off, here's the anatomy. The rotator cuff consists of four muscles. The supraspinatus is above the spine of the scapula. It initiates shoulder abduction and also stabilizes the humeral head. Remember that the shoulder is a shallow joint. There's not much anatomical structural support, so we rely heavily on active stability from the rotator cuff muscles. The infraspinatus and teres minor are the next two rotator cuff muscles located under the spine of the scapula. They produce external rotation and also posterior and inferior glide. And then lastly, the subscapularis is between the scapula and the rib cage. This makes it unique from the other rotator cuff muscles as the only one that provides internal rotation and anterior support. Together, the rotator cuff functions to not only just rotate the shoulder in and out, but as we said, to center the humeral head and keep it stable during different shoulder movements. You can really think of the deltoid, for example, as a primary mover pulling the head of the humerus up during a press, and without an active cuff, there's not a lot of counterbalance. The humeral head can migrate up into the acromion, causing pain and limiting function. But that said, there are a lot of ways to effectively train the rotator cuff to improve its function the way this doesn't happen. One example would be a bottoms up kettlebell carry. This is a great way to target the stabilizers and those co-contractions that improve that role of stabilization at the glenohumeral joint. Another way is with a face pull with horizontal abduction and external rotation. This targets the infraspinatus and the teres minor specifically. We can also train this movement quite heavy to get hypertrophy in the rear delts at the same time, making this a really great go-to shoulder prehab exercise. If there is some shoulder pain present, I do like starting with isometric holds at different angles. Simply standing next to a wall and trying to lift the arm up like a lateral raise, pressing the knuckles into the wall is a great way to target that supraspinatus tendon. I've given this to a lot of clients with a partial supraspinatus tear to start to rebuild that strength. Similarly, you can do an isometric pushing the knuckles into the wall, trying to externally rotate the shoulder to target the infraspinatus and the teres minor. Okay, and here are some bonus tips for optimizing arthrokinematics and osteokinematics of the shoulder. Number one would be cue scapular posterior tilt and upward rotation during overhead pressing. Ensure that the inferior medial border of the scapula is gliding up and around the rib cage. Number two, pair heavy lifts with light, well-controlled rotator cuff work to improve positioning and arthrokinematic function. Three, make sure that the rotator cuff drills you're doing are done with intentional posture and positions. Don't just crank through sets of 20 or 50 as fast as you can. Make sure you slow them down and control them to ensure there's tension throughout the repetition. Okay, so to summarize the four biomechanics principles that every coach should know, number one, use length tension relationship to optimize your hypertrophy and your performance training. Two, consider eccentric and concentric orientation to change the way your clients move and their experience of tightness. Three, use osteokinematics and arthrokinematics to spot deeper joint issues and fix them at the source. And then lastly, four, understand the real role of the rotator cuff to build a robust shoulder training program. If this video helped you level up your knowledge, hit that like button, subscribe so you don't miss any future videos, and drop a comment below with a concept that you want us to teach next. And if you're ready to master anatomy and biomechanics with crystal clear 3D visuals, go check out our new course, Built with Muscle and Motion, at themovementsystem.com. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.